Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're back for part two of our countdown of the top 10 running backs in this year's NFL draft. Joining me for that is Jake Vogel. Jake, how you doing? I'm doing good, Ken. How about you? Always a pleasure, my friend. Always a pleasure to talk football with you. Just a great a great rundown from 10 to 7. And usually we get rid of a lot of the names because there's less overlap from 10 to 7. But we had the same number 8 guy, the same number 7 guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Will Shipley was a guy. By the way, you asked about his fumbles. He had three last year, four the year before, one the year before that. So I think that's got to kind of weigh heavily against him in the draft. Definitely not a guy that is a have-to-have running back as far as like, either of us is concerned. But uh, right. an interesting guy. Uh, so, uh, we also talked a lot in that first episode about what the Ravens current situation is and what their needs are at running back and you know, stylistic fit was a major component of that discussion, but I encourage you to go back and download that and give that uh, a chance. Jake is excellent. We love having him on whenever we can. And, uh, uh he's just gives, uh, some great analysis of these running backs in particular. Uh, so let's move on. And so we would normally be at my number seven guy, but since we have the same guy, we're at um, number six guys. And I think we hit the same number six because they were at number 10 opposite for each of us. Oh, yes, that, that's right. So your number. My number six was Braylon six Allen. Braylon Allen. And I already gave you my number six, which was Isaac Garendo. Okay. So very good ones. If you go back to the first episode, you can hear about those guys. Uh, so we'll go ahead to your number five guy. All right. Um, one second. As I flip through the pages. My number five guy is Ray Davis, running back out of Kentucky. Um, To me, he's just a solid all-around back. Um, Something I was very surprised about when I watched his game because, you know, you you watch college football in general, or at least I do watch a lot of games in the SEC, and you see this player and you kind of imagine what style back he is. And the furthest thing I would expect from a guy like Ray Davis is to be, you know, this receiving back. Um, but that, that is who he is. Uh, he is, I mean, he's more than that, but um, he has some really, really nice um, receptions on tape. Uh, that, that's definitely a big part of his game. And, and I think that that fits well with what I would like to add if I were EDC or just as a fan, I would like to see the Ravens add a, a running back that has some receiving chops um, to, you know, complete the running back room with Justice Hill and Derrick Henry for this year. Uh, he's definitely that guy. So um, he has good shiftiness, vision. Um, I think he does a good job at making people miss. Uh, you see some of that stop-start ability in his game that is – you know, reminiscent of a poor man's Lamar Jackson where, you know, he he's going down the sideline. He sees a defender coming towards him, you know, east, west, and he will stop and that defender will go by him. And then he'll, you know, he'll make the next move um, downfield. So I I like that about his game. He has a number of explosive plays. Um, I I watched the Kentucky Louisville game, which is of course a rivalry um, for them. And, you know, he, he had some, some nice explosive, you know, 13 yard runs, 20 yard uh, reception, you know, touchdown catch. Um, The screen game is good. You know, some of his movements also remind me of a former Raven, uh, probably two actually Um, Ray Rice and Mark Ingram a little bit, both of those guys um, in their, their lower compacts body type, um, what they did in the receiving game reminds me a little bit of what Ray Davis does. Um, Let's see. Uh, Did I have anything about his pass blocking? Not in that game. Um, Yeah, he's a solid pass blocker. I I noticed that um, in the Kentucky uh, Clemson bowl game. So that was this year, 2023 tax slayer bowl. And, you know, some people will, you know, take a bowl game, you know, with a grain of salt. Um, and I think that's fair, but, uh, you know, he, he went out there and competed and he looked pretty good to me um, in his pass protection in that game. And um, uh, yeah, I, he shows explosive touchdown receptions um, against Georgia, you know, my, my school. 
So he did hurt. not he did not have a huge game against Georgia. I felt like they did a pretty good job against them, but he had a nice uh, catch and run for about a 25 yard score um, in that game. So yeah, solid player for me. All right, so. I had Ray Davis down at number nine or 10. Actually, I think it was 10. And then I, I bumped him with a couple of late elevations. But there were some risk factors for Davis I didn't like, although I like some of the same things you do. So I'll go through my, my scouting report here. 5'8", 2'11", just a ball of muscle, runs a 4'52". He's not going to get faster, folks, because he's 25 in November. So he's an older player. Uh, two years at Temple, two years at Vanderbilt, the final year at Kentucky. I think it's fair to say he's really never played with an elite offensive line. Now, maybe Kentucky is a little bit better, but, of course, they, they're playing in a high-class league there. So relative to their league, they're not going to be that that good. Um, uh, he's one of the few running backs who really took advantage of the COVID years. There's a lot of guys who came out. There are some guys who, who stayed in long, but there's plenty of guys who are coming out after three years because they realize, hey, running backs get hurt. Um, the, the NIL money is sometimes attractive. To, to running backs and sometimes it's not, but most of the top running backs are coming out after three years of experience. Uh, I, you know, I noticed some of the same things you did with regard to the Lamar Jackson thing, and that's a very high compliment. So carefully give that out, but you see a one cut runner here who's a, who has a, a definite two part running style. And the first part is let me get to level two. And he's, he's kind of has a, a little bit of a patience about him. Doesn't have to hit a hole super quick. He wants to make sure he gets into level two cleanly. And then once he's in level two, he reads leverage in level two and level three to cause missteps by the opponent. But he's definitely not just playing his own cards there. He's not just being a speed guy, which, by the way, probably wouldn't work for him at 452. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't really think Lamar has the kind of speed that was ever ascribed to him. Uh, He runs in third gear. He makes people miss. We know how effective that is. So Ray Davis is somebody who who could do more with that. His... um, uh, after contact numbers were not great, 0.26 um, missed tackles forced up per attempt is good. 3.81 yards after contact per attempt is okay. They're both better maybe than you would expect from a back his size, that you, you might go down a little easier. But but they're, they're, they're not what, you know, make him draftable to me, not, not the, 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 the um, you know, the large stone in that balance. Um, complete non-factor as a pass blocker, as I saw it but he's a good receiver. Now that's not the greatest combination because you want a guy who's a really good pass blocker. If he's going to be on the field on third down, I think Ray Davis could help you on third down as a receiver way at 8.3 yards per target in college had 140.9 passer rating throwing to him with seven touchdowns. Um, that's a hell of a receiving threat, yeah. but you know, to, to be on the field at the NFL level, he's going to have to be able to do a little bit of pass blocking. You would think so. Uh, maybe he's an early down receiving threat. Justice Hill remains the guy on third down, but um, and maybe at five eight two eleven he can learn some things from Hill. Um, you know, we talked about Derrick Henry probably can't transfer effectively knowledge of how he can pass block because he can't suddenly make Ray Davis be you know five inches taller or whatever it is and, and twenty five <laughs> pounds heavier. Right. But, uh, but uh, maybe he can learn something from Hill. Useful gadget addition, by the way, I think as well. Another guy who, with his receiving chops, could line up wide at a pony. Mm-hmm. Uh, you put two backs on the field, you, you, you all of a sudden have I, – I, I've mentioned this before in the show before, but there's probably nothing that makes me, like, change the octave level of my voice more than a pony backfield on the on the field and seeing it. It's like, pony backfield, pony backfield. It's just, <laughs> it's, it excites me right away when I see it. I know that something interesting is going to happen. And there's some sort of misdirection or, or whatever, but it's uh, uh, it's one of those things I, I like to see when I'm at the game. And Ray Davis, I could, could give the Ravens uh, some of that. Number 12 guy for me on my honorable mention list and uh, uh, really only had two backs there. I think both of them are probably draftable. If they could get Ray Davis, he'd drop into my value range in the sixth round mm-hmm. as being a guy who I think it would be exciting. So maybe if we're watching day three of the draft together, uh, Jake, uh, we'll get to see his name called and be really excited about it together. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, I, I completely agree with the things you said. Um, the The value range for me, it's not like I would want to take this guy in the fourth round or anything. Probably probably late fifth or sixth round is, is where I would say he falls, even though I do have him as my RB5 right now. So, Good. All right, well, my RB5 was Blake Corum, who we talked about earlier a little bit. Obviously, a a, uh, a polarizing figure in a lot of ways. A lot of people love, just love Corum. Mm-hmm. You know, 
know, what are you doing? You know, thinking you want to draft him in the fourth round, but uh, that's where I am on him. It's just he's, he's a uh, I could if it's not him, it'll be somebody else, and and that'll yeah. be okay. So we go to your number four guy, and I'm guessing we probably have the same top four guys, and I'm impressed by that because my number four guy, I, I didn't know if he was going to make your number four. Um, well, we're about to find out, I guess. Um, I have Marshawn Lloyd, uh, the running back out of USC. Um, I believe he played at South Carolina prior to that. Yep. If you say um, USC, you're always right with Marshawn Lloyd. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, so, yeah, he, he was another receiving back. Um, watching his games, the thing that stood out to me was the best thing this guy does is catch the ball out of the backfield. Um, he has, he has those explosive measurables. You see it, um, in his runs as well. He got to play with Caleb Williams. So that probably helps his tape a little bit. Um, USC didn't have the best offensive line necessarily. Um, the skill talent wasn't perhaps the greatest, uh, but, you know, he's playing with probably the quarterback that will go first overall, whether whether you um, like Jaden Daniels more or Drake May more, um, you know, he's playing with a very good player at that position. And what he is doing with that player is catching the ball, which is really cool to see. Um, natural hands, he's a outside zone type runner, Um I did note in here he likes to bounce outside too often. Um, he he's a good he's a good player in a pony backfield like we were talking about. You put him on the field and you put Derrick Henry on the field. You know, there's probably a little bit of a tell. Maybe you put Justice Hill, then then you don't know what they're gonna do. But um, you know, he he provides um, value that way. I, I kind of see him as a one speed back. He doesn't really change his his speed too much throughout the play, but his speed is fast, and, and that's a good thing. He does lean forward, falls forward um, in piles and as he's being tackled, which is always a plus. Um, what else do we want to add? Um, he did fumble against uh, UCLA. I'm not sure what his fumble numbers are um, for his career. He, and he does have the nice jump cut ability. Um, overall, a player that I could um, I could really be happy to see drafted by the Ravens on day three of the draft, um, fourth or fifth round, somewhere in there. All right. Also had him at number four. Uh, another uh, good re- good back for a lot of reasons here. And let me go through this because uh, I'll start though with. I, I think you're right about the bounce outside nature of his game. He's been bashed for that a little bit, um, but he's like Collins and Dixon. He's just, let me bounce. Okay. Then bounce again. Let me bounce again and see if I can get outrun the defense to the outside. But you know, the funny thing about him was I thought his missed tackles force numbers, which are really good are a combination of all the good elements, speed, elusiveness, contact balance, and, and power. Um, it's, it's kind of the ideal situation that you're not depending on one asset to create missed tackles at the NFL level games faster, obviously he's going to have to, he's going to probably have to do all these things better to even come close to maintaining those numbers. And, and probably they're not maintainable is the, is the truth of the matter, but 0.41 missed tackles force per attempt is excellent. And 3.97 yards after contact per attempt is excellent. So uh, really did very well there. Um, he's 23 turned 23 in January already, which is a little bit older, but it's not terribly old. He's, he's kind of in that, in that uh, little, if you're looking at it, it might be at about the 30th percentile for age of running backs, meaning you'd rather they'd be 20 and they'd be 100%, say, on that scale. Um, he has 325 college touches, so I'd say his tread wear is okay. It's not, it's not at the, the – certainly not at the very best level. There's some guys who have even fewer touches, even some that are older, but uh, but he's got few touches. And, and some of the younger players have, have way more touches like Braylon Allen um, at Wisconsin. Um Let's see, 9.0 yards per target as a receiver. So completely agreeing there. I think that's one of the things that that can really help him. But he's got way too many misses as a pass blocker. So, you know, at 5'9", 220, there's real question over whether that can be fixed at the NFL level. Uh, Maybe the guys on the team can fix it. Hopefully the coaches can take some time and and, and improve that quality. 
or maybe he's a two down back who, who you use as a receiver on those downs. Um, and maybe you use as a gadget player as well as, as you alluded to, but I, I like them too. And uh, you know, the, the, the combination of the power profile, uh, good speed, his real grown man strength at 25 bench reps. Uh, there were some guys, by, I think Blake Corum had an outstanding bench mm-hmm. number, like 27 or something. But if you look at that, Blake Corum has some of the shortest hands you'll ever, shortest arms you'll ever have. That's a, you got to really um, discount some of that. And we've had other people, if you want to listen to a great explanation of why, I mean, I think it should be obvious to people, but, it, but, but, but we had Josh Reed on to talk about, which group was it? Was it the edge group? No. Was he the edge group? Yes, he's the edge group. He's yes. the edge group. And, and and he talked about them and, and gave a really good explanation as a weight from a weightlifting background of why it's the hardest part of the rep is starting the rep. And that's, you know, as soon as you can start to get your arms extended, you're fine. So having shorter arms really helps with the um the the, the negative leverage you have at, at that at that start of the rep. So uh it's a good listen, but anyway, if it if, if the players with shorter arms, I definitely discount it. The, the linemen, and there are a couple guards out there with 34-inch arms who, uh, you know, benched 29 times and went on just outstanding numbers. So, uh, actually, it might be inside linebackers. Think about the inside linebackers who were in that group. So, uh, tr- you know, some truly great bench numbers this year, but it's very much arm-like dependent. But anyway, I like Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, my number four back overall, just like you. And uh, I was actually a little surprised that, that you had him as high because I thought that's going to be one of the places where I had a guy higher than you might have otherwise done it. I guess you had Corum lower, um, way lower, and I had Corum a little lower, which was one of the kind of mm-hmm. surprising downgrades. Yep, absolutely. So I guess moving on to number three, this guy uh, could definitely be number one for you or many people. I- I've heard him as the number one guy. That is uh, Jonathan Brooks out of Texas. Um, he's a really nice player. Um, I, I probably ding him a little bit for his injury. You know, he's coming off of an ACL tear, um, and the Ravens have dealt with countless injuries to running backs over the years. Everything that I have heard recently tells me that his medicals have checked out. He's supposed to be ready for the start of the season. I, I always say give a guy a full year from the injury before you expect them to be ready. Uh, maybe that's a conservative approach, but you, you see you see guys try to rush back and then get re-injured or injure something else, and it's just an ongoing um, you know thing that's that's a, a real big negative. Uh, but besides the injuries, let's just get into who he is as a player. Um, he is an all around um, all around back. Uh, some of his negatives, um, he has a number of east to west runs that don't really get going, um, but he has enough speed, whereas that shouldn't be the case. Uh, let's see. He likes to run up the middle um, as well. So he, he's a he's a well-balanced um, running back in his approach to, um, to running the football. Uh, he's explosive. Uh, He is one of, you know, these top three guys that we're going to talk about for me are all very fast, explosive guys tested, you know, like four, three, nine, 40, um, great vertical jumps, all all of that kind of stuff. I I actually don't know that we have um, numbers for Brooks because of that injury, but that's what I, that's what I met. That's what I would guess for him. Um, uh, the quarterback play at Texas was not great. I'm not a huge Ewers fan, and I know that, you know, going into this upcoming season in college football, he he is projected to be one of the top quarterbacks. Uh, but I, I saw a ton of flaws in his game. He is a nice receiver. Uh, Jonathan Brooks is absolutely somebody that um, can come in and be the best receiver in the room um, that we have right now. In the running back room. In the running back room, of course. <laughs> uh, he's not Zay Flowers out there or Rashad Bateman or even Aguilar, um, but he is, he's a good um, receiver out of the backfield. He has good contact balance. Um, he does create additional two-plus yards on most plays. 
Um, uh, hopefully that shows up in his numbers. I, I haven't looked that up, but that's just what I saw on tape that he is, he is good at creating more um, after he, um, after he either catches the ball, um, which of course you would want more than, than two yards uh, after the catch, but uh, after contact as well, he, he seems to be a good, a good player in that aspect. Um, <clears throat> He doesn't fit the goal line or short yardage back prototype. That's not a problem for me. I'm I'm more so suggesting this is a player that is your number one running back. This is the guy that you draft to be your your regular average, maybe better than average, but I mean he is your your starting running back. He's not a specific type running back. He's not your your short lineage, short yardage back. He's not just a receiving back. He is your running back um yeah it, you know going into that he does get stuffed a little bit on those goal line carries so you have a different guy for that um but you know in between the 20s he's going to be your number one guy um for most teams uh he just has countless explosive plays against um kansas uh let's see what other against oklahoma um, Alabama, that, that game was fantastic. If you watch the Texas Alabama game, even live, um, that was a very good one to watch in 2023. Um, he shows, he shows up to be a, an adequate pass blocker in that game. Um, but once again, my notes say, you know, he's not a good short yardage back. So I'm going to ding him for that. Uh, and he has, you know, some explosive runs in there um, in, that, in that game as well. But I don't have any any major thing to add, so I'll, I'll let you talk about him and where you have him on your board. Yeah, balanced outstanding back, and I think you, you kind of alluded to this here, but uh, a guy's got incredibly little college experience for a fine back. And why? Well, he played behind Bijan Robinson, and then before that he played behind Rashawn Johnson, right? Yeah, Roshan Johnson and Bijan both came out last year, but they were they both came out last yeah. year. Okay, right. so it's, it's obviously that's that's not a great you know <laughs> a great situation to be in. Surprising he didn't switch schools at some point in there, but missed, missed tackles for per attempt were point thirty four yards yards after contact per attempt were three point nine one. Both those are excellent. Um, I you know I think his cutback runners, which is what I really would classify him as, but cutback runners are fairly scheme diverse. Obviously they work very well in zone, but you always have use for the ability to cut back and limited cutback ability, limited ability to stick your foot in the ground and move back in the opposite direction, change direction quickly. It's just, it's weak for a running back. And so a, a Braylon Allen or somebody who's got less of it, you, you, you've you got to grade him down for that. Um, he's got a mix of, in his case, elusiveness and power to generate that high MTF. I, I, I love to see it's a couple of things. That's not just speed. Or it's it's uh, it's uh, elusiveness. It's power. It's contact balance. Whatever it might be. Um, Two hundred thirty-eight college carries. We talked about that already, right? Um, and I watched the cut up of the Oklahoma game. Interesting cut up, by the way, because it wasn't a unbelievably great game. It's kind of one I like to like to watch. He ran twenty-two for one twenty-nine, which is about what he does every week. Uh, one touchdown, eight missed tackles forced. Um, both teams at that time were five and zero. Oh. So uh started off, he adjusted extremely well to a shot put pass from Ewers that, that was just, literally, he was like caught behind the line of scrimmage, just kind of pushed the ball over and you know, stayed focused on it, didn't turn his eyes off the field, didn't do all the things you could do wrong on that play that might actually cause a turnover, uh, although it would have been all on the quarterback in that situation because he just he put up a little lame duck of a, of a pop-up there. Um, it, it was a It was a nice adjustment to football, made about five yards out of it, which was just a nice thing to see. Texas ran some counters in this game. Uh, they have a very big tight end there, uh, mm -hmm. and they ran a lot of tight end left guard counter play. So the left guard leading, which is not unusual, but instead of a tackle following, they had they had a tight end following. So kind of an unusual scheme they have. Uh, he reads his blocks well in front of him. I thought for that, so that was something I, I liked. Uh, has good hands in the receiving game, um, and and when I say that, he he made some one handed catches. Um, I expect pretty much all running backs to be to be a, away from the body catchers. 
not double catchers, although there are some right. that, 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 that you know, are double catchers. They'll talk about that. You listen to Danny and Tomlin or, some, some, or someone like that watching the combine, and he'll talk about double catchers that the running backs are just you know not as natural and whatnot. And it, it, the good ones, they just it sticks right in their hand like mm-hmm. like it was like thrown in Velcro thrown into a Velcro wall kind of thing. Uh, um, and one of the things you mentioned early was you know about him not being a goal line back. I think some of that that I saw Texas had the most unimaginative way to try and score from the one yard line late in the game with the 27 to 20. Um, and they tried three times in a row to run the football with Brooks. Right. And they had, I think they had five total defensive linemen on the field among those three plays, it might have been four, but they had two defensive linemen on for one play, but they were just, they're just trying to rugby scrum the ball three straight times. Right. Um, and they, they failed on that. I, I assume they passed the ball on fourth down because it wasn't in the cut. Or they tried something. Um, else. Let me see if I have it. Because um, I definitely. It wasn't, it wasn't him anyway. I can tell you that. He, he yeah. Didn't the ball. Uh, I'll, I'll continue. If you, if you find that, that's great. Um, he's got a limited history as a pass blocker. So far, he's been fine, but he's only got 59 total pass blocking snaps, which is not that unusual when he has only 238 carries that you'd see that. But in 32 targets, He's had 10.5 yards per target, and that makes him one of the best two-way mm-hmm. threats in all of college football in terms of the run in the past. I, I am concerned about the injury. He's still my number one guy, and part of the reason he's still my number one guy is I don't have anyone drafted in the first round, or I don't have anyone drafted by the Ravens in the second round. So he, to me, um, if the injury forces him to drop to the third round, um, I think that he could really represent value for the Ravens at that point. So uh, I, I'd be pretty excited about it, I think, if they could get him. Um, at that point, he's a one cut runner that kind of complements Henry and Mitchell pretty well uh, in terms of what he can do. He's also an all around player, so he could end up being your third down back yep. um, that, that takes some time away from Hill. I think the Ravens want to get that duplicated since Hill's a one year player at this point. Uh, so, so it'd be a, be a nice place to, to add a, a guy who has some receiving chops. And I, I think Brooks is the guy. And, and in this class, he stands out to me as the guy. Ahead of the, the the next two, we're going to talk about um, uh, as the as the first guy I would expect to see off the board, and the guy I would be most excited about the Ravens having. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so to get back to you on that one, uh, you are correct. I, I did not see him on the fourth play. He got stuffed three times in a row on that goal line. Um, but yeah, everything that you said, I, I I agree with. He could easily be my RB one. Uh, I just the ACL and, you know, not, not knowing the, the medicals other than what people say, uh, you know, uh, the, the top three guys, I kind of like very similarly. So it'll be interesting to hear what, what you say. Oh, let's, let's go to my number three guy then. Um, who's Trey <clears throat> Benson of FSU, uh, 60216 at 439, 40 solid jumps. He'll be 22 in July. So one of the younger backs, not the youngest by any stretch. Um, limited tread wear, only 316 attempts in three years, one at Oregon, two at FSU. So he's one of the coming out early guys. Uh, excellent contact balance shows up on tape. He runs very hard, the smaller steps, um, and the missed tackles forced and the yards after contact per attempt don't really validate or corroborate as good a post-contact runner as I expected him to be, which is one of the reasons I dinged him. Um, Voss, who's a Florida State fan and my partner on Friday Morning GM, uh, is not a big Benson fan in terms of him being a difference maker. Uh, he thinks he's he's uh, uh, and and that's boy, that's tough. That's tough love coming from a guy like Voss, who's a Florida State fan. So, mm-hmm. um, but three point five three yards after contact was twenty fourth out of seventy eight running backs. He's in the top third. It's just not as good as I I thought I was going to see from that. Um, he had point twenty nine uh, missed tackles. Missed, missed tackles force per carry, which is good, but it's not at the top of the class. So um, I kind of worry about that at the NFL level. Those numbers are going to are going to both go down. And uh, uh, so something zero fumbles in 340 college touches. That's a big plus, and I think that might be some a reason why the Ravens have them higher on the board than a you know a Shipley or some of the other guys who've had a few fumbles. Corum has had some fumbles in the in the college ranks, so uh, that may weigh against them. Uh, he was shut down by LSU and Clemson. So there's some, there's some context dependent, not as great play. Now I do expect that LSU and Clemson are going to be tougher opponents for a team like Florida state 
trying to rack up rushing yards against. So it's not like I wouldn't expect some drop off, but there's a there's a very broad difference there between his performance there and uh, his performance within the ACC. Uh, the cut up versus Louisville in the conference championship uh, was a good one. Um, he, he he played reasonably well, ran between the tackles for the most part. Where Louisville was extremely effective. I don't know if you know this about Louisville. They're very big in the middle there, um, and I thought he did a pretty good job of of allowing his screen blocks to develop in front of him in that game. Uh, did not really run from the mesh, but he did run behind a lot of counters. So he's got some of that already in his profile that used to running. Um, some of these power schemes uh, that way. Nice jump cut from his tackle force in the game. So it's good to see that from a bigger back um, that, that he's, he's, he's a mix of ways in which he can get an MTF. I thought he ran very patiently behind the right guard and right tackle pulling left. Uh, so the play actually developed pretty slowly and it was a nice, nice run for him there. Broke away untouched for the longest run of the day in the closing minutes. Uh, very solid field vision. I, you know, the patience is usually in field vision go right together in a back, by the way. Um, they won't be patient unless they have good field vision because otherwise, you know, backs want to get north and south or uh, they want to try and make some bounce to the outside and make people miss that way. Uh, took two wildcat snaps in the last four minutes of that game. So it's the conference championship game and they're wildcatting in the ball to try and end the game. That's a, that's a, a lot of confidence in that player. Um, he, he's, a, you know, he's an additional power block back, back which, um, has a significant overlap with Henry and, you know, does it replicate what they have? Maybe. Does it also add a player who would be very useful with the Ravens offensive line? If they can get it back, by the way, that's something I, I, I t- Hey guys, I want to tell you about the Eufy video lock. Because when I'm not podcasting, I am. My day job is a smart home specialist. And the Eufy Video Smart Lock is perfect. This is what you guys need to go get. It replaces the deadbolt on your door. So now you can come home without fumbling with keys. You can just type in a code. Or, even better, use your fingerprint to unlock. After one second, you put your finger there, pops out, my door's open. It's perfect. It also is an integrated video doorbell. We've all seen the video doorbells. We all know the ones that are out there. I've seen many of them get stolen. No one's going to steal this because it's your door lock. It's impossible for them to steal. There's no monthly fee. Other ones do. But this one, it'll record locally, so you never have to pay if you don't want to. The battery, it lasts up to four months. Plus, it notifies you ahead of time. And I mentioned earlier one-second fingerprint recognition. No, I meant one-second it opens the ai self-learning chip will learn your fingerprint even faster and then it opens up completely keyless entry no more keys and i know i set this up as i'm a smart home specialist but anyone can install this all you need is a phillips screwdriver that's it and then you're done guys i love this product make sure you check it out now here's the easiest thing to do just go on to Google or whatever you prefer and search Eufy Video Lock. That's E-U-F-Y Video Lock. Or visit eufyofficial.com forward slash video lock to see how you can gain complete control of your door just like me, just like Ken. Talk about the Ravens offensive line sometimes, except it's going to be the same as it was these last few years when I don't think we know that, you know, the Ravens have a lot of work to do to get this offensive line going again, but I am optimistic that with the interior line, the Ravens have, they're going to be somewhat similar in terms of creating level two opportunities for some of these backs. Um, they certainly got power guys. If they, if they end up starting Boris in Cleveland, those are two very powerful players next to Linderbaum, who's an excellent finesse player, obviously um, to, to give you a lot of run backing chops, run blocking chops on the inside and uh, Benson is a guy who could take advantage of that. So, uh, you know, n- nice player, number three on my list. Um, you know, I have him ahead of, uh, of Marshawn Lloyd, so you know I like him a lot. I, I did take Voss's um, kind of negative uh, note about him to heart and uh, and dropped him maybe one spot uh, in my rankings. Okay. Um, so we have number three and number one flipped. Well, so that's that's another time that we've done that. I I really like Trey Benson. Um, 
to me, he's much more than a power back. I, I don't even know that I would categorize him in that way. Um, the, one of the things that stood out watching his games were, were his, you know, soft hands. Um, he really knows how to catch the ball, um, does it well. I, I think that's an element of, of his game that FSU, frankly, did not use enough. Um, and all of these top four guys, I believe, um, were underutilized to some extent in the receiving game. Let me just stop you there for one second, because I didn't mention that, but but he's at nine and a half yards per target. That definitely is a big positive. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great number to to go along with what I am uh, I'm talking about here. So, yeah, I, I, I noticed, I think, in, in every single one of his games that I watched, just great hands. Uh, if you want to see a highlight real catch, which, you know, don't let it um, – you know, uh, frame your your viewpoint on him too much. Um, watch the FSU Clemson 2023 game. He has an unbelievable. This is like a George Pickens esque catch on the left sideline on a wheel route. He he does like a a 360 jump spin. Uh, I think it was one handed catch, and he toe taps. Uh, I think two hands on the sideline. It, it's just, it's an unreal catch. Um, something that you don't really see out of running backs very often. And you do see the one handed catch, like you were mentioning from uh, LaDainian Tomlinson. Um, you know, that, that should be a pretty natural thing catching away from your frame. And the good thing is it's natural um, in the, in the case for Benson. Uh, I found him to have really good burst and acceleration um, and decent speed. Uh, that is, Definitely um, evident when you when you see his combine numbers, his RIS. Uh, I believe he tested really well, like a four three, um, a high four three guy in the um, the forty yard dash. Um, he he breaks away some some good ones. He has good contact balance. Um, ta- he breaks tackles. I think that's where you get into the. Um, the style of back that you were mentioning, that, that physical imposing running back um, similar to a Derrick Henry. Uh, he doesn't really go down on um, on first contact. So I, I think his contact balance is a plus in that way. Um, and let's see. Yeah, you know, the, they're like the LSU game. He definitely did struggle at some points, um, just having some small gains in there. That could be due to the offensive line and the level of competition between the ACC and the SEC. Uh, but yeah, definitely need to mention there are negatives um, to him. But, you know, in this top three grouping, I think all of these guys are good and, and would add something to the Ravens. So I, I would disagree with Voss there. Okay. Um, saying that I, I think he's a difference maker um, to some extent. Let, let me ask you a question with regard to the duplication component, because, you know, he'd be coming into a backfield that already has Derrick Henry in it. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think the Ravens will try and significantly reduce Derrick Henry's workload in order to max it? Do, do you think they feel like they can maximize what they get from Derrick Henry by reducing his workload? Um, it's kind of a nuanced answer. Uh, I would say, yes, the, the Ravens do believe in limiting, uh, guys workloads to an extent. Um, and I think that can help their longevity of the season, how they're playing at the end of games, um, individually, and then how they're playing, you know, into the playoffs. So I do think that they will have that approach at the same time. I do expect Derek to be, the bell cow running back in this room. Um, Justice Hill being probably the clear cut second, unless the Ravens do draft a rookie that just kind of shows out um, and, you know, takes, takes that position position away from Justice Hill. Uh, But I'm not, I'm not really worried about the the duplication element uh, because the Ravens running back room as it stands right now has diversity. So, in most directions that that the Ravens would go to adding a, a player, there's going to be a level of duplication. So uh, you, you're you're really talking about building the position out for the future, and also adding 
an element to it now, um, even if it does kind of have that cross referencing with another player. So I, I, first of all, I, I, I agree with your comment you, in terms of building for the future. You know, in some cases, if they drafted an um, an Allen or an Estime, who are probably the mm-hmm. most extreme power backs in this draft, right. um, that that either of those guys would be duplicative of Henry and, and not as good, probably. For sure. Um, but but would also be guys you you really are worried about what are they going to do for you in 26 and 27 as much as what are they going to do for you in 24 and 25 while Henry is here. Um, and 20, you know, we don't know if Henry's going to be here in 25. If he falls off the table, right. it's too much money to pay him in 25. So, you know, he may be a one-year, $9 million player, in which case you've got a three-year back behind him you'd be happy with. Mm-hmm. I actually think we're going to see Derrick Henry not lead the league in carries this season. I think they're going to intentionally reduce his workload. I think some other back will emerge somewhere else who will have 300 carries or close to it. And we're going to see um, uh, Henry with, uh, you know, 210 carries, 225 carries for the Ravens, something like that, where they really reduce his workload and not due to injury necessarily, but that they're trying to trying to keep him fresh. Um, one of the things about Edwards that made him effective was that they always kind of limited his carries. They never gave him a, a ton of carries, which is why he never rushed for a thousand yards, despite being an extreme high yards per carry guy for his whole career. And the other thing about about Henry, they always say is, well, he gets better between twenty and thirty carries. He gets better. Well, no, he's <laughs> not getting better. The other team is getting more tired. Offensive line for Tennessee, when they were good, was pushing around teams a little bit more and, and making it easier for him to run. It's not Derrick Henry getting better. I can assure you of that because yeah. they, they, you know it, that's not the way the human body works. Derrick Henry, if they if they suddenly came up with a strategy for him to just bring him in in the second half of football games after the Ravens have beaten up some teams in the first half. I think that could work. And if you go mm-hmm. back to the eighties, who was the guy? Uh, Ricky Irvins of the, um, of the uh, Washington Redskins at the time uh, would come in for the second half and, uh, and he would be terrific. Uh, it would just be way too much for, for uh, other teams to handle. Uh, I'm not saying that they should go to anything strict like that, but, but, you know, some, some, you know, mix of carries where Henry gets higher weighted towards the second half when you try and run out the game and lower weighted towards the first half would make a lot of sense to me in terms of, of getting that. And for that reason, I think there might be uh, an opportunity for a younger power back to come in and take some of those early carries, start wearing down that defense. Um, and a guy like Benson could be good. A guy like a guy like Audrey guest me would be, would be excellent. And a guy like uh, a Braylon Allen would make sense in that. In that sure. Too. Yep. Completely agree. And, and the reason that I like Benson you know, significantly more than Estime or Allen is is the receiving game. I, I think it's yeah. just untapped potential there, uh, as, and, as well cool. as as well as his athleticism in general is just it's at a higher level. The the speed, the explosive plays that you're going to get out of Allen are are definitely higher than what you get from those other two guys, in my opinion. All right, we got one back left to talk about. I would be shocked if it's not the same guy, but uh, if uh, I'm guessing it's an SEC back, but you tell us. It is. It's an SEC back. He wears um, orange and white. That is Jalen Wright from uh, Tennessee. He is a very fun back to watch. Um, you talk about explosive player, and you look one up in the dictionary, you might find a picture of him because <laughs> that, is, that is what he does. He – he definitely is utilized utilized more as a pure runner than um, some of these other guys, but he does have um, some soft hands um, and receiving chops to him. Uh, I, I think that is untapped uh, for Wright, uh, and I think that that's something that he can improve on, and you know, just teams can get more out of at the next level. But um, he has so much burst and speed. Um, he runs the ball outside. He can run it inside. You just give him a lane, get him to the second level, and he's gone. He is he is a special back in that way. And honestly, uh, I, I very much considered having him as my number one running back. So it, trust me when I say this running back class is not great, but I would be excited about Trey Benson, Jalen Wright, Jonathan Brooks, Marshawn Lloyd. Any of those backs going to the Ravens, I'd be pretty – Pretty thrilled for the future. I mean, pairing pairing one of those guys up with Keaton Mitchell, and you got you got two, and then Justice Hill may or may not be here. 
but that, that's just that's pretty exciting. Just the the amount of speed on the field at one time would be crazy. Um, he has a nice uh, jump cut ability. Um, makes defenders miss. Let's see. Uh, I believe he has some uh, good vision as well. Um, the contact balance is there for him. He does not go down from first defenders. He is a good screen receiver. Um, most consistent plays are up middle runs. Um, turns turns what should be a one yard gain into five or t- or nine. Um, it's just uh, you know s- something greater than five yards there. Uh, I'm not really sure about him in pass protection. I I don't think I saw a lot of that um, in the games I was able to watch of him. But he is an all-around running back um, with plenty of skills. I don't really love the quarterback, Joe Milton, that, that you know, he was working with at Tennessee. Um, it's a wild card. Wild card. He has plenty of tools, but um, not, a, not a great college player. Kind of like Anthony Richardson. You know, Richardson was better, but uh, similar in that they were not spectacular in college but they have tools that would be exciting at the NFL level if they were able to develop. And I, I just think they're two different players, but you can kind of see a comparison there. Um, let's see. Another good screen reception. Strong runner. Yep. Strong runner up the middle. And he, he will just break them. He will break long runs. Um, I think he had a really nice game against Kentucky in 2023. Um, yeah, 52 yard score, uh, 18 yard gain, uh, just, you know, plays here and there all over. Oh, oh yeah. Here's one. The Yukon game from 2023. I don't know if you saw that one. That's lower competition level. He had an 83 yard touchdown. It's nice. Always nice. Uh, I've got a few things to say about Jalen Wright. I think you covered a lot of it. Uh, but in terms of athletic profile, he's outstanding at, at uh, uh, 5'11", 210, 438. He's pretty much prototype size and speed for a running back. It, you, you couldn't ask for more. Great jumps. He turned 21 on April Fool's Day. So uh, that is very young for, for the running back group. There, are, there is one or two younger – there's at least one younger player in the top ten, but there might be another one as well. Uh, top of the class yards after contact um, didn't quite match up with his, his missed tackle sports bro attempt were good. And by the way, all it takes is like one long run to change that relationship and make it a little out of whack. Cause if there's a, if there's a Yakko play that led to an 80, 83 yard run, if, if you didn't in fact make that run untouched, that could be affecting that 4.35 number mm-hmm. uh, positively. And it, despite the fact his MTF spur attempt are, are good at 0.32, but they're, they're not outstanding. Um, you, there's guys over 0.4 in this draft, and uh, and he's not one of them, but he's a, he's a hell of a back nonetheless. Um, was not an impressive receiver in terms of production. And I look at yards per target very heavily. He's at 5.6. Good yak per reception of 7.9. A uh, lot of negative A dot, some red yak he's picking up. So he's, he's, he's getting a lot of his yak is coming, getting back to the line of scrimmage. Um, you, you mentioned pass blocking. That's something he's really improved on in his three years at Tennessee. So um, actually, did he, yeah, he played all three years at Tennessee, right? He didn't play somewhere else? I believe he was at Tennessee. Okay. So so uh, uh, 35% of his snaps, uh, he was used as a pass blocker this last year. So obviously, they're, they're, you know, they were loading it up for Milton, who – uh, uh, we don't need to go to Joe Milton. He's, he's in the quarterback show. Go, go listen to it there. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, pass block him 35% of the staff. He's they trust him to do it. And, and it's something he improved that to it. Still has very modest tread wear with only 367 career carries. Um, that's, that's probably in the low end of moderate. If I were looking at it on a one to hundred scale, that'd be about a 65 to me in terms of, of being a positive for the guy. Um, he would be absolutely among the best fits for the Ravens and Lamar. Um, and even better if the offensive line could be rebuilt. I think he'd be fine, by the way, if, if, if the offensive line struggles this year, if they're not who we hope they'd be, if you know they can't really replace Moses effectively and Stanley is not playing at the same level and maybe the guards work out a little bit less well than I'd hoped. Obviously, if everything goes to crap, they're, they're not going to be in 
nobody's going to be any good running behind this this group. But uh, Jalen Wright is a guy who has a has a real good chance to be good, regardless of who the offensive line is. And uh, uh, I liked him a lot. I liked him. He's my number two guy, and um, uh, yeah, I think you, you captured a lot of of, uh, of the other commentary there, so I won't duplicate. But uh, a guy I'd probably like in the third or very early part of the fourth round. I don't know if he'll last till 113. Probably not. Uh, a lot of people have him as the first or second running back coming off the board. So it wouldn't shock me if he goes as early as the end of round two. Um, to me, the highest the Ravens could possibly draft him would be at the end of round three when they pick. Uh, I guess if they traded back somehow in the middle of round three and – um, DeCosta saw value there. I'm not going to get upset about it, but I think uh, you know, team has a lot of needs and they have relatively little top end draft capital to use. You know, they have six picks on day three. Uh, we're going to have Jake on, by the way, for day three of the uh, of the uh, draft review, and that'll be a lot of fun because uh, uh, we'll be having our watch party and and six picks to be had over those five hours or so will be a, a, a kind of a rapid fire pace. But uh, he's a guy who who. I, I would I would love to see him at 113. I'd be okay if they picked him in the third round. Yeah, I agree with that. These these top couple of guys have that talent to to go in the third round. So I mean, possibly even the second round for for one of them. But um, yeah, I wouldn't want the Ravens to take one in the second round. And and probably yeah. won't happen. So yeah, I, I don't anticipate that. Um, so yeah, that's Any our honorable top mention 10. players you want to talk about? I, I do have some honorable mentions. Um there's a there's a couple guys here. Um because they're honorable mentions, I maybe won't go as deep into them. Just but one thing I'll you just... liked about him has been our usual mojo of doing that. So I I've got I've got two guys and one of them was on your list. So uh <laughs> I, maybe I got two other guys also. Okay. Um, if you just want a receiving back, a guy that has some juice, maybe he's more of a – okay, Trey Benson, Jalen Wright, Jonathan Brooks, and kind of Marshawn Lloyd, as well as Isaac Garendo. All of those guys you could consider home run hitters or maybe uh, triples. This guy, Dylan Lab or Labe, um, from New Hampshire – is probably you know a ground rule double type guy. He, he's not the he's not the most explosive player, but something that he does have that is absolutely near the top of the class is his chops as a receiver. Something that I've talked about a million times on here. Um, so he reminds me of like a Danny Woodhead, who the Ravens very briefly had, and I was really excited about what <laughs> what he could bring. Um, he he's a good route runner. Like he could line up as a pure slot receiver for, for your team and you'd be okay with it. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to bring him up in, in that way. I, I don't prioritize him in any way, shape or form as a draft pick. Um, I would be fine with them drafting him in the seventh round or something like that. Uh, definitely as, as a UDFA. Uh, but I thought I'd mention him just because of how outstanding um, he is in the receiving game. A very interesting player, and I did not look at him as a running back, but 1,654 college receiving yards in five years at New Hampshire on 197 targets, so 8.4 yards per target. Um, he had 68 receptions this last year. I mean, that's Lydell Mitchell coming out of the backfield, and, uh, uh, you know, fine, fine player there. Caught 68 out of 88 balls, seven touchdowns as a receiver this last year. It's uh, – uh, I almost thought I was still looking at his rushing statistics when, it, when I looked that up here, but uh, but that's his receiving statistics and definitely would give you that uh, that thing. I'll name one of my guys uh, is, let's go with Bucky Irving of Oregon. A lot of people have him in the top 10 yep. of their group, and, and he's a guy uh, I liked, but in the end I had to drop out, and he, and he ended up being number 11 with Ray Davis, number 12. 5'9", 192, uh, plays through contact well, had good – Missed tackles forced in yards after contact per attempt, but a, but a smaller, non-ideal frame, not good um, receiving numbers for his career, um, and, and a combination of 
being a 6.5 yards per target guy, which is not terrible. It's okay for a running back, but being a terrible pass blocker. He's ranked 70 mm-hmm. of 73 of three draft eligible running backs by PFF. So that's not good. And then I think he also had a fairly low percentage of total plays as a pass blocker, which you would expect if a guy's that bad. Um, not not a terrible running back by any stretch. If they got him as a UDFA, I'll be excited about him. If they got him in the seventh round, I'll be excited about it. But he, he, he carries a much higher round grade by some other people, and I expect him to go earlier. Uh, and I, I just I wouldn't be that excited about it. Uh, I completely agree. He's an honorable mention for me. So many people love this guy, and I watched his – I watched, but three or four of his games, and I, I didn't really see it the same way. Um, something that you talked about earlier and is, is very true. Running backs can force missed tackles or break tackles, um, run away from tackles. You know, those are the kind of the three ways um, that they, you know, can continue to make positive yardage on a play. And Bucky Irving does one of those very well, and the other two he doesn't. Um, the one that he can do is uh, – he makes guys miss. He can shake and bake, um, which is really cool, but he lacks the athleticism. This just like completely shows up for me. He, he just doesn't have the prerequisite athleticism to be great at the next level. Um, I it's hope really he not a great I, long speed. No, he does not have a great long speed. Um, he does not have – great power through through contact either um and and that's an issue so the guys that make defenders miss and then there's pursuing defenders immediately thereafter are going to have to deal with contact and he unfortunately doesn't have the ability from what i've seen to really power through that and and keep going so i i know that his numbers for Forced missed tackles is like incredible, or that's what I heard on a on a podcast from from some PFF guys. However, what you see when you watch him is somebody that makes a def- the first defender miss, but doesn't have enough juice to to get going north and south immediately after and actually pick up yardage. So for for me, he's he's a guy that I couldn't put in my top ten. Um, he catches the ball decently well. That that's kind of what he did more than than in anything. He doesn't really profile as like a pure runner of the football, even though that's his position. And I I wouldn't say that he's a receiver either. Um, so I, I'm probably lower on him than most people are. Fair enough. Let's hear one one more from you. Sure. You don't need a whole report. Just but one or two comments. Is cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, we're cool. Um. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll, I'll mention this guy because a lot of Ravens people are putting him in mock drafts. Um, Rasheen Ali out of Marshall. Uh, he's a he's a good running back, um, patient reader of blocks, kind of you know, kind of Le'Veon Bell esque in that way. Um, he's a good cutback player, so you know he he does that well. At, once he's cleared the initial line of scrimmage in those trench defenders, he is good at cutting back against the grain and, um, you know, breaking away from, from some of uh, the linebackers and defenders at that second level level. Uh, And he has natural hands. His vision's pretty good. Um, But he doesn't necessarily have a ton of um, explosive plays on tape. He's, he's more of a solid four to six yards type dude, which is perfectly fine but I wouldn't spend a high draft pick on him at all. In agreement on Ali, uh, he's a UDFA to me. If they pick him up, that's fantastic. Keaton Mitchell didn't get drafted last year. I don't see why Rashid Ali gets drafted this year. Right. Um, but, you know, he's he's a guy who who I I would not be upset if he comes out on a list of 15 players. I really wouldn't be upset if he if they spent a seventh-round draft pick on most of the guys that I that I would be happy with as a UDFA, but there's a lot of guys that they can choose from who are really good gambles as seventh round picks, starting with Vorey's last year, you know, in terms of, uh, of guys that get Geno Stone a few years ago, they haven't always made those seven th- seventh round picks paid off. Like they've made the sixes pay off, but they have occasionally, they've done it at safety. They've done it at some other good positions, safety with Ralph Staten and Stone. Um, they, 
they have a knack for being able to find guys. And then it seems like their priority UDFA, they have an amazing hit rate on. You know, Bart Scott one year, they were not allowed to say his name at the facility because they were afraid it would get out that they wanted this guy out of northern Illinois and nobody knew about. Hmm. Uh, but, but you know, he ended up being a, a priority UDFA. And, they got, and obviously Mitchell was a, was a huge success last year. Patrick Ricard, I don't know that there was any competition to get him because uh, I don't think anybody really had known what the Ravens would do with him in turning into a defensive lineman to a fullback. But they've had such good success linebacker also with the UDFA level. It's almost like their sevens have not been as good. So I can't get that upset if they used a seven on a player like Ali, and yet I, I I would not be excited by it. And I think he's a guy you just sign. You don't you don't worry about uh, uh, drafting him in this case. So anyway, not not a bad player. I got one other guy. Just go one thing quickly to say about him. Frank Gore Jr. is in this draft mm-hmm. and is an un, he certainly is an undrafted free agent. Not a guy you draft. Absolutely great pass blocker, and would be a guy if if you want that, uh, he'd be real interesting. I, 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 what I found in a lot of the other positions is I really love the lifer players who come from a football family, come from football bloodlines, and they always are more polished at important um, things about the game that their parents were good at. So Ellis, the pass rusher, and um, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is there uh, in the draft this year. There's some others, too. Um, they, they all – they have polish, and most times I'm kind of a little down on polished players because I think that that limits what upside they have at the pro level. So if you've been on, if you've been really exceptional in terms of your productivity, but you do it without polish, I think that's a that's a good thing uh, for for going to the NFL level. But in, in in that case, I love to see a guy who's already a great pass blocker like Frank Gore is. And uh, if the if the Ravens got him, I I kind of be excited about that too. And again, got to be a UDFA, but but would be excited. Yeah, uh, agree. Agreed with that. For me, he is a UDFA type player, and I did notice um, specifically his pass pro was good. Um, there, there are a couple other guys I could just list the name of, and and that's it. Sure. Um, Dylan Johnson out of Washington. He is, you know, he's he's something. <laughs> I don't. I just because I'm trying not to say anything about him. Sure. I, Isaiah Davis is another guy I watched. Um, not crazy about him. And the South Dakota State guy, right? South Dakota State. A lot of people really like him. I, I didn't get that. And then um, Carson Steele out of Ball State and UCLA. Uh, most of what I saw from him was his Ball State days, but I, I actually believe he's a draftable player um, in the seventh round or so. Huh. I'll have to look at him. He's not, not on my list at all. So that's, that's a guy that uh, new name to me. Well, Jake, really appreciate you coming on and spending two hours with us doing this. I hope uh, uh, the fans appreciate this kind of an in-depth review from uh, uh, somebody with uh, Jake's experience watching SEC football and other college football. Um, but uh, tell folks where they can find your work either online or talk to you, talk football with you. Yeah, I'm on Twitter or X at Real Jake Vogel, V-O-G-E-L. And like Ken said, I'm a big uh, Georgia fan. Um, Ravens fan, and uh, I get into college football as well as NFL in general. So feel free to to chat, see what I'm talking about, and and comment or or whatever you want to do. All right, I, I'd also encourage people now to join us for the NFL draft watch party we have on an annual basis. Um, it'll be on on video. It'll be recorded for all three days. We're going to have a number of panelists on. Uh, we're going to have very much a rotating panelist thing, as we've had in the past, but also try and get people um, who are watching the show to jump on with their questions. So we're trying to see if we can we can get that done with video, if possible. Even if not, we'll just do it out of chat and, and answer your questions directly. It is a great time watching that very organic way to see reactions from other Ravens fans about how these draft packs are working out. I just enjoy that about it very much. It's extremely Raven centric. So you, while you've got ESPN or the NFL Network on, and they're going through their draft coverage, um, they'll be do, giving you all these. Um, uh, what did you have for breakfast stories about the number one draft pick? We we, we don't care about that. We, we're we're all about how does this pick affect the Baltimore Ravens, either in terms of what what players are left in this draft, or AFC North opponents, or you know what might be left when the Ravens uh, get on the clock themselves. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a great way to watch the draft that is different from watching, you know, lowest common denominator packaged draft content that is more for 
teams are fans of a number of different teams. And I understand why they do it that way. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying, if you're a Ravens fan, I think you'll appreciate our watch party a little bit more. And that'll be on YouTube. We'll have links for that going up. Uh, Jake will be a part of that. We're, we're excited to have him, of course, as well as will be a number of your other, your other favorites from, uh, from this show over the years. We'll, uh, we'll be on for some portion of the draft. Jake, thanks again for joining me. Yep. Thank you, Ken. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.